The Dr. Oba Tashaka Show. Free your mind and the rest will follow. A show for all who are on the journey to discover the truths about their identity, history, culture, politics, spirituality, and family relationships. This is a show for the Black Freedom Movement and the Black Power Generation and the Hip Hop Generation, including Black Lives Matter and associate activists, all of whom are seeking change. Dr. Oba Tashaka and his guest are dropping knowledge and insight from his successful organizing, research, writings, and innovative thoughts, the best of which have piped into God's mind to lift you up higher and higher. To the bosses, OGs, rappers, influencers, and those looking to evolve from the constraints of misinformation and miseducation to build a foundation for personal growth, love, and mental freedom. Check out the wisdom of the OR. Yeah, that's the original revolutionary, Oba T, who inspired a million black men with his rousing speech at the Million Man March and who continues to fight, write, and speak the truth. Dr. Oba Tashaka is one of the deepest deep thinkers in the world today. A quote by Dr. Asa Hilliard. Dr. Oba Tashaka, then Bill Bradley, was the best leader organizer in the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE. An endorsement from Dr. George Wiley, Associate Director of National CORE and the best organizer blacks produced in the 1970s as the organizer of the National Welfare Rights Organization. The Dr. Oba Tashaka Show. Free your mind and the rest will follow. Greetings um, to the viewers of the Dr. Oba Tashaka Show. <clears throat> this is a special treat and to African people, wherever you are in the world, this is a real special treat. We have uh, Dr. Brother Honorable Julius Garvey, who's here, and um, we're going to do a collaboration on leadership slash organizing training. We also have Brother Shaka Satori, uh, who's here, and um, he has been responsible for organizing a book speaking tour uh, for Dr. Julius Garvey uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, Sacramento and uh, going down to San Diego and doing other things. He's a serious brother. And brother Ustadi Kadiri, uh, right here, who is going to be uh, discussing a component of the Leadership Training uh, Institute uh, that we are going to be launching on YouTube. It's one that we've had going for a while in the community. So the purpose for today is to cover a range of topics on the Per Ankh, which in ancient Kemet meant House of Life, the highest university system in ancient Kemet, Amokar Cabral, the greatest uh, leader, organizer, thinker in the 20th century, Ella Baker Leadership Slash Organizing Training Institute. So this is a system for training organizers to help in the revitalization of African communities and African nations globally, in the U.S., in the Caribbean, in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, wherever they are in the world. And uh, certainly the Internet will give us the uh, main uh, route to that, but a good part of this will be done face-to-face -face as well, as we've done in the past. So... First, I just want to give an overview on the Per Ankh, House of Life, Amal Karkabral, Ella Baker, uh, Leadership Training um, Organizing Institute. Per Ankh, uh, House of Life was the highest university system in ancient Kemet, the highest in the world. Uh, Dr. Theofelo Benga, um, I consulted with him on this, and he has basically shaped this component of the curriculum. 
because he's the master in ancient Kemet and uh, he reads Meru Netcher. And so while he was on the faculty at San Francisco State, I interviewed him for 18 hours as a part of a book I'm writing on masters. He's one of the masters and that included on Purim. And so there's a curriculum here and he wrote the Purim part. I give credit where credit is due. The great master, the greatest master on ancient Kemet in the world today. So um, Purim was the place where you train all the skilled people in Kemet except warriors. The warriors were trained in the palace of the pharaoh. Um, the uh, system of Pura is a outgrowth of secret societies in Africa. And it was based on the same principles. It grew out of that, except the secret societies in Africa trained warriors too. And most of our people who came to the Western Hemisphere during enslavement between 18 and 35, they were all trained in secret societies, trained as warriors. And that's why they were so hard to beat in Jamaica, the Maroons. That's why the Africans in America outnumbered through forward great resistance movements and in the Civil War uh, put forward <coughs> over 170,000 black men and some women disguised as men. And they were the balance of power that determined the outcome of the Civil War. Uh, the Civil War, uh, the North had only won one battle before Black Center, mm -hmm. and it was that warrior tradition. But it was also the other traditions carried out in these secret societies. So uh, Per Ankh is that place. Per Ankh has a set of symbols, and the symbols uh, of Per Ankh in the center is a sar. And a sar is symbolic of the ancestor the great ancestor along with a set who is also uh, one of the netters in the symbol for Purim. Asar is symbolic of life, death, and rebirth. So this is a place of transformation. You die in the place of being Negroes and you're reborn in being reborn as Africans. You die as Dr. Garvey is going to discuss from the state of mental slavery, of mental colonialism, to free minds, free spirits, and free bodies. And so we're adapting that to today because the Kemites didn't have the problem of freeing yourself from mental slavery or mental colonialism. So we are adapting, and that's what this is. Um, so Asar stands in the middle. Asar stands on nine bows, B-O-W, the prominent weapon of that day. That represented the nine enemies of Kemet. And so what this meant is the house of life was a place where you train priests, astronomers, uh, doctors, all of the skilled people of Kemet. Rarely, if ever, was a non-Kemite trained there because you're being trained to reproduce your society and you're being trained to defend it. So standing on the nine bows means that you're being trained to defend your own civilization. And this is the essence. Above the symbol of Paran is a figure with his arms extended left and right and legs extended front and back. And he's moving from east to west. This is symbolic of moving from birth to death to a rebirth to a new life. And then his arms being extended, it means that Paran also is a place of life, house of life symbolized by the aunt and by the elements, water, earth, fire, and air, and by the directions north, south, east, and west. So it means that it covers all domains of life. And so this is the basic meaning of Purim. We are adapting Purim to today. And so we've added to the Purim um, house of life leadership, organizing, training, two masters, one female, one male. Emil Carr Cabral, who viewers of this show know, uh, is a person that I still regard as a master and draw from. Uh, he's the greatest leader in the 20th century. According to many, this is a debatable point, but I think that he beat Mao Zedong. I think he beat Ho Chi Minh. I think he beat Malcolm X. I think he beat Fidel Castro. And Malcolm, I love. And Garvey. I don't think anyone beats him. 
Why? He didn't organize as many people as Garvey. So Garvey beats him on the organizing level. And um, Malcolm was good at bu uh, building a di disciplined group. But Emil Carr Cabral was a balanced revolutionary. Like Malcolm and like Garvey, he underwent a transformation of consciousness. So he freed his mind. He had experienced mental colonialism. He thought he was Portuguese. And so he reached a point through an African study group uh, in Portugal as an agronomy student where he said, we decided to be African. And then he tried to create cadres or organizers who he could reproduce in terms of this psychology, this psychology of freedom from mental colonialism. Uh, so that was his first gift, is that he was a walking, talking African. He walked his talk. He practiced his beliefs. And he was a man of great integrity. Secondly, Cabral had the best analysis of the social structure of his people, better than any analysis of any revolutionary or scholar in the 20th century. And he gained that through an agronomy survey that he did sponsored by the Portuguese. The Portuguese did not know they were sponsoring a study that would lead to their own death as uh, colonial masters. And so he looked at the social structure of Guinea, the South. He looked at the different ethnic groups, and he noted that the Balanti, for example, were a people that um, came out of age race societies where there are no kings and queens, classless society, uh, democratic society, and they were the first to join the struggle. And in fact, they gave Cabral his strategy for guerrilla warfare and gave him his best ideas for how to run a country which has let the people run. I don't know if he fully appreciated that, but he was setting that kind of system up. So that was his second contribution. His social structure analysis was so good that when he tra trained his organizers, that, and they were trained in Guinea, uh, they were young people, uh, some of whom he had to teach how to read and write. When they went back into the country, they knew how to appeal to the people, and uh, their struggle started at the center of the country rather than on the border. And that hardly ever happens in a revolution armed struggle because they don't have the support in the countryside. The Portuguese had their armies all on the border, and when they rose up, they rose up throughout the countryside because his organizers had been trained in how to approach elders and then how to win the people. He looked at the Muslims and saw that many of their leaders had compromised with colonialism, but they devised strategies for reaching them. And so after he completed the agronomy study and had a social structure study, then he trained his organizers in that, in Guinea. The third quality of Cabral is he was a great military leader. Um, he inflicted over 50,000 casualties on the Portuguese and lost only 2,500 people. He considered the death of two people to be a catastrophe. He was not trained in military arts, but uh, he was a brilliant strategist. His main role, though, was as an international diplomat getting international support. So we choose Amilcar Cabral because he has the balance of freeing the mind, he has the balance of understanding the principle of knowing your people, and he also knew his enemy. He predicted that the Portuguese would have a uh, movement to overthrow the uh, dictatorship in Portugal. And in fact, the movement he launched encouraged the Portuguese generals to overthrow the, di the dictator um, in Portugal. He predicted that, made that happen, you know what I mean? And one way he made it happen is he was a humanitarian. He would kill no children, no women, even though the Portuguese did. He refused to. And that humanism, along with his ability to kick the Portuguese behind, convinced them they had to give up. There was no way to win. So Cabral, Ella Baker, Ella Baker and Malcolm X are the two best organizers we produced in the 60s. I used to say Malcolm. But then the more I study Ella Baker, then I realize it's like comparing apples and oranges. They're equal. 
but they each had strengths in their own areas. Ella Baker organized more black folks than any other organizer in the 60s, mainly as the director of organization for the NAACP. And uh, she wanted them to be their own leaders. The NAACP didn't, but she was able to establish contacts all over the South. And when she started working with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, then she turned those contacts over to SNCC. She was without Ella Baker, no SNCC. That is generally stated by Julian Bond and others. And uh, without Ella Baker, uh, SNCC would have never been organized, but at a key point, without Ella Baker, uh, SNCC would have fallen apart because there were certain points where they had disagreements and Ella Baker was there to see that it didn't lead to splits. So uh, she was great in that. Uh, Ella Baker favored group-centered leadership. And uh, she came out of North Carolina. And so in that area, um, she came out of a communal community where um, black people uh, ran their own community. Her, um, her grandfather uh, owned acres of land and used it to build a church, to build a school, and to pawn, at least go to the bank and get a second to loan to people in the community when they were out of work. Uh, Ella Baker picked that ethos up. Ella Baker believed that uh, leaders should not be leading people in a direction, but their role is to support people to lead themselves. And that's the main reason we picked Ella Baker, because the format for organizing today, the best format, is not one centered on singular leaders, but on group leaders. And so Ella Baker uh, represented that. Ella Baker was a situational revolutionary. You ain't never heard of this one. She didn't have a long list of dogmas. Her ideas were suited to situations that would help black people change society. And so I call her a situational revolutionary. That also made her very hard for the FBI to target. They couldn't figure Ella out. She didn't do it for that reason. And so uh, she would offer ideas on situations, on how to radicalize situations. And so that was her real contribution. She was the first executive director of King's Organization, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And she was at the, the core of uh, disturbances and revolutionary activity throughout her life. So this is the adaptation. And so in this uh, Peron, um, Amy Carker Brawl, Ella Baker Leadership Organizing Training Institute, we favor group-centered leadership. And that'll be the format we use, similar to the format of Black Lives Matter, which has consciously picked up the Ella Baker Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee position. So that's the adaptation, and um, we'll be using that to apply to the realities of today. Um, so there'll be two methods for training uh, in Peru. One will be webinars. And so the first one for YouTube will be a um, year-long, twice-a-month webinar on Free the Mind. That will be the first stage of leadership training uh, in Peru. And then we'll be going into black communities doing face-to-face -face, uh, leadership slash organizing training. So that's basically um, it. So I'd like uh, Brother Garvey, um, Brother Shaka Satori, and um, Brother Ustadi to make any comments they would like to make on this. What do you think of this? You got any suggestions? So forth. Well, you know, um, it, it's fabulous in terms of uh, the, the, the scope that you just uh, outlined because it, it takes us uh, certainly back to the beginnings of our civilization and the original principles that our ancestors understood about life. As you mentioned, the, 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 the per ant, uh, this is where, shall we say, life was studied and um, young people were prepared to live a, a life that would represent um, ma'at, which is the basic principle of life that our people um, um, discovered. 
Uh, you could call it the mystical principle, but it's not a mystical principle, it's, it's a factual uh, basis of both uh, evolution as well as, as human life and, and how um, people should live individually and collectively in community. So you're going back there for us to start over, shall we say, with those principles which um, have been put aside by the, the culture that we, that we live in and the culture that has dominated us at least for the last 500 years, if not longer, for the last 2,000 years, so to speak, on and off. So I think that's very important because um, Sankofa, we have to go back to the beginning and in order for us to, to separate ourselves, shall we say, from the cultural uh, situation that we're in, which clearly is a negative situation for us as well as for the dominant culture because it has so many problems that it can't solve. It's always going to war to seek peace, which is a total impossibility. And it, its economic systems are, are scavenging the earth in terms of resources. And um, in the way in which the financial system works, it accumulates resources for one group of people as opposed to the majority of people, which is not um, collectively what, what the civilization means. The civilization means that Everybody within the society should be working together for mutual prosperity. So I think it's admirable that you're doing this and um, it's, it's clearly necessary for our young people because our young people um, um, do not have a roadmap. And, and the point of the, 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 the Per Ank, um, um, the Institute was to give a roadmap to the young people so they would know how to live and, and what the principles of life were. And nowadays we have no principles because um, um, we, we, we have no fixed sense of, set of values or morality. It changes day to day. Um, uh, today skirts are up or skirts are down. And um, um, uh, today uh, gender is defined different from what, what gender was 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. Um, so, so, so values are, are very changeable within this uh, society. Um, uh, uh, therefore, one really has no, no security. One is always in a state of anxiety as to whether you're behaving correctly or not behaving correctly. And then, of course, there's um, um, uh, punishment if, if you're not uh, politically correct, shall we say. So this will give our young people um, um, a, a foundation on, on which to stand. And I think that's fundamental in terms of young people going out into the world. They have to have the proper foundation. Otherwise, they'll be swept aside by each... Um, new way, shall we say. And, um, so I endorse uh, uh, what, what you, you put together. And I certainly would like to participate in it, and I certainly would like to co-opt it in terms of oh, yeah. um, <laughs> what I'm trying to do. Uh, it's in a similar vein, but I think you're yes, like yes. years ahead of me in terms of what you've been able to structure. So I look forward to us working together. Definitely. That is the key thing. Yeah. Any suggestions that you have? Uh, any things that you think that are really important in terms of uh, this leadership organizing training? Yeah, well, I think the spiritual aspect of it is of extreme importance. Um, early on, we were talking about meditation as a part of it. You, you didn't emphasize that in terms of your presentation. But um, um, getting to know yourself, as you know, that was what was over the, the, the mantle of the house of life, was know yourself and know yourself. And um, this is key because self-knowledge is the beginning of all knowledge. And, and, and with self-knowledge, then you actually have access to all knowledge. And um, that makes you a master of your mind and therefore a master of um, your body and the society in which you live. And that's what you're trying to do in terms of leadership training. Leadership has to come from somebody who has mastered themselves. You cannot lead people when you don't really know who you are. So self-knowledge is primary. So I know you'll, you'll emphasize that uh, part of it in terms of uh, a, a meditation um, 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 part of the program, as well as the, 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 the historic uh, part of it and the intellectual part of it. But the, the spiritual part, access to your own uh, spiritual self as an identity is of extreme importance because that truly anchors you in the universe because you're connected to source. And that's important. And that gives you a great deal of strength and, and confidence and conviction in terms of what you do and how you manifest yourself. Yeah, and I think that um, that's a very important thing you're stressing because we have to be the truth that we're talking. 
So in uh, the operational principle for how this training goes is the African principle. Mm -hmm. To know the truth, you gotta be the truth. And that's not easy. And that requires transformation. Mm -hmm. And so your point about self-knowledge, that is key, self-respect, and then self-love. And self-knowledge is the key because it's out of that that we cultivate our inner garden to become better human beings. So you placing the first <clears throat> emphasis on spirit, key. That's what I like about you, brother. <laughs> spirit. <laughs> spirit is primary. Uh, That's the kind of people that we are. Exactly. Spirit, mind, and body. Exactly. You know, balanced together. Exactly. But, but spirit is primary. Exactly. Yeah. Not abstract spiritual. That's okay. I know what people mean, but they're intellectualizing. There's no word for spiritual in any African language. Why? Because it's a do thing. Yeah. Do what you believe. In slavery, in this country, we called it him be people. Mm. Him be whatever they say they are. Mm. Him be Nat Turner. Mm. Him be a nominal Christian. Mm. Actually a spirit man. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. So yeah, that's, that's the key thing. Mm. And, and I always say in life, there's two important things. One is good character. The other one, one that is Ustadi's favorite word, discipline. Mm. Self-discipline. Yeah. And that's working on whatever you're doing mm. in life. Um, Ustadi, you got any comments on this? What do you think of this? Well, I'll pass it over to him. We, 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 because with self-knowledge comes self-discipline and then self-transformation. Right. You can't transform yourself without the discipline. So over to you. Teach. I agree. I mean... Mm -hmm. I definitely agree if we're talking about a nation, we're talking about a race, and we know that the smallest <coughs> unit within a nation is the family. And if the family's out of control, so is the nation's out of control. So I think one of the things is, is very, is, to me, it's always going to be important that we train the youth. Uh, I think that's the way it should be. Because when I was coming up, if I was... I don't remember how old I was, maybe, maybe 12. You could actually be in the room with grown-ups and hear them talk. Otherwise, you was not listening or looking in grown-up face. That was, that was a backhand. So I'm not saying that we need to backhand children or youth, but they have to be trained. That's why on the continent, they always have the rites of passage or the grade aid system. So I think we're right on the right path. I agree 100%. Uh, Brother Shaco? Okay. The only thing I can add to what these brothers, uh, Dr. Garvey and Brother Ustadi, brilliantly broke down is just to say that, you know, through people like Carter G. Woodson, Theophilo Banga, you know, Dr. Ben, you know, uh, Dr. Clark, you know, Amos Wilson, all these great minds we have the knowledge and have had the knowledge. And what we haven't had is the institutions and the system by which to uh, methodically uh, liberate the minds of our Africans, those at home and those abroad. And I think that what you're presenting is a key piece to that vital piece to the puzzle. Uh, in addition to that, the only thing I'll say is, I don't think we should brush over what Brother Ustadi said when it comes to rites of passage. I think that's a major, major uh, key to this whole process is doing that and, and, and making sure that we understand uh, or our youth understand by the time we call him a man what manhood is. Right on. <clears throat> right on. Um, the first objective, and I think... Uh, you, Brother Garvey, uh, announced this when we were having a discussion on the show, uh, Wednesday. Um, your first point that you made about your father was that he came here with a desire to see that the minds of Africans were free from mental slavery. You hit the nail on the head. Rather than starting off talking about all the projects he carried out, what he achieved, you got down to the psychological component. And so um, in the uh, Peranac House of Life, Amy Carker Brawl, Ella Baker Leadership Organizing Training Institute, that is at the heart of this. At the Dr. Obertashaka show, that's why we did this. I consulted to study uh, other people in our organization and asked them one question. 
Do you think this will work on the internet? Because what we want to do is affect minds. And they said, yes. And Stoudy was giving me uh, various tips for how it could be done and critique me on my first three or four shows. What I should wear, how I should look, <laughs> what I should sh say, and his buddy. I had to remind him that he said yes, because he was starting to wonder if it could be done. And he said, yeah, 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 you can do it. You know what I mean? So uh, the first objective of this show, the first objective of this training is to focus on free the mind. And so, um, Brother Julius Garvey, would you make some comments on <clears throat> the importance of that? how you see that working in terms of leadership training, building organizations in our community, revitalizing our communities, revitalizing Africa and Africans at home and abroad. Yeah, that's, that's a, a whole um, a big area. And obviously it's, it's of extreme uh, importance because um, we need to liberate our minds from mental slavery. We've been incarcerated in the European mindset for the last 500 years. And you can't access spirit until you liberate mind. Because what mind is, well it, is the activity of consciousness. It, it's, 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 it's conscious energy acting in the world. Um, so if, if your mind is conditioned, then when the spirit acts or your energy acts, it acts in a conditioned situation um, where you are repeating the past that you've been told to do. And, and therefore, it's a cyclical existence. And you never get to your creative ability, which, which is your true uh, uh, self, which is connected to the universal consciousness, uh, per se. So um, the, the first thing is, is understanding mind and analyzing uh, mind, um, which is, is not an easy thing to do. It's, it's part of the meditation process. Um, and there are different ways, shall we say, um, uh, to look at it. That there's a meditation where um, you, 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 you more or less access uh, your spiritual self in terms of self-remembering, and there are different ways to do that. And there's also the other meditative technique where you analyze mind. You're able, um, shall we say, to, to, to be aware of mind. In other words, you have to silence your mind to a certain degree so that you have awareness. And then um, uh, you can look at mind and see how mind functions. And mind functions, um, one of the ways in which mind functions is of course as ego. Okay. And, and that's the big, the big thing that gets in anybody's way because everybody thinks ah, it's me, it's I, mm -hmm. and it's self versus mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. So that's the dualistic thinking that we've absorbed in terms of the Western mindset. It's a dualistic mindset. Um, which is the self versus other. It's individualism. And individual is described as, 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 as mind and body, which is separate from every other mind and body, as well as being separate from the environment. Mm -hmm. And this is absolutely ridiculous if, if you look and you understand the process of creation in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, before the Big Bang, what was there? I mean, there was an entity, if you want to call it an entity, which is a spirit, a global spirit, or a uh, universal spirit, that decided to create and manifest itself in terms of its total potentiality. So, so there was that creative you know, moment um, which has brought everything into existence. But it came into existence out of something that still um, unfolds it as well as uh, manifests it. Um, so it's an it's a imminence as well as a transcendence. And that's basic. You can't just look at things as being uh, absolutely separate. Mm -hmm. um, because again, and this uh, comes back to something we've talked about, meaning that quantum physics has, has, has now, now shown that, that the, uh, you know, thing, things are not separate in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, there's a unified field out of mm -hmm. which everything comes. Mm -hmm. And then the mind actually influences the unified field, mm -hmm. of course. Because the mind is the unified field, mm -hmm. you know, except that our mind is conditioned. But when you get to the unconditioned mind, which is spirit, it's part of the unified field. And that's how we are one with God, in terms of the, of the, the religious uh, 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 statement of, of our relationship to the environment. But it is mirrored 
in quantum physics at this time, you know, where the mind influences what you're looking at. So, so, so that the, the world that you see is a projection of your mind. And, and, and you, you can never simply interrogate um, objectively. There's no such thing as absolute objectivity. Teach. Teach. You, see? Teach. <laughs> you have to come back to the subject. Who is it that is being objective? You see? And there's no separation between subject and object. And, and that's the whole business of consciousness being conscious of itself. Um, so that's who and what we, we were as Africans. And to know we have to go through the bondage of mental slavery. So, so we, we, we have to do that uh, self-analysis, that mental analysis, mm -hmm. and, and, and deconstruct the mind that has been created for us to get to that unconditioned mind, which is spirit, so that we can manifest our true creativity and, and, and create the best world that we want for ourselves mm -hmm. as well as you know, other people around us. So, so, so the mind is, is key. And, and um, we need to institute a method of analyzing mind as part of the self-knowledge and the self-analysis that we're talking about. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> you know, it's such a relief to hear this kind of conversation because most of our intellectuals won't discuss it on that level. It's mm -hmm. a theory. At best, it's spiritual or sacred, but when you're talking about the fact that you can't free the mind um, unless you're able to get to the spirit. In other words, um, the key part of freeing the mind is so that you can have access to the spirit. That is very profound. And what I've found, because we're going to discuss this in greater depth on the despiritualized part, is that when you access that realm, in Dogon thought, uh, I come up with a formula that, that the Dogon have because their every part of their system is a miniature whole, every part. And so uh, I drew a formulation from the Dogon system of in anything is everything. So in this human being is everything that is the cosmos. That's the holographic principle. Uh huh. Yeah. The what? Holographic principle. Yeah. That's one of the principles that have been found out in terms of the, this whole subquantum me mechanics. Yeah. And, and the holographic principle is that um, you can take a small part of, of this whole and, and, and take it away from the whole, but it can replicate the whole. Exactly. It, it, it's, exactly. it's like a drop of water um, with the ocean. You take a drop of water out of the ocean, but it's still the ocean. Mm -hmm. exactly. Its constituents, exactly. as, as, you know, that what it's made up of is still a mirror image of the ocean. And that's who we are yeah. in terms of uh, our essence. Our essence <laughs> is the same as the universal spiritual cosmic consciousness. And, and, and that's what we're manifesting when we get to spirit um, beyond conditioned mind. Yeah. Because we're a manifestation, we're the part within us of a whole, which is God, a part of God is within us, so we're the whole and a part of God. Yes. And so when you access that, when you're accessing God's mind, in the anything is everything. So George Washington Carver in the peanut got just about everything. And by the way, he said a peanut could sustain your whole health, that it would take you through life you could sustain yourself just with a peanut because he understood there was more than just uh, one nutritional element, mm -hmm. protein, in a peanut. Yeah. But he was accessing God's mind. I've had that experience, so I know what you're talking about. But when you're in the other mind, you only get the part. Mm -hmm. And that part is separate. Mm -hmm. the, and that's false. Mm -hmm. And so the objectivity that you're talking <laughs> about is a part of that. Mm -hmm. it, it's creating a false consciousness that you're separate from the cosmos. And then when you have that false consciousness, you think you can then go out and play games with the cosmos to the point that, as one of the mad scientists said, you can create a new one, a new nature. That was Francis Bacon, who's the author of empirical science, mm -hmm. you know, who was not a scientist. He said that, first of all, you would study nature because God has a way of he hiding things. 
so that you could learn its secrets, mm -hmm. so you could control nature, mm -hmm. and then create a new nature, mm -hmm. uh, genetically modified organisms. Organisms mm -hmm. are that, yeah. and they are designed to destroy any attempt to create or reproduce nature based on the profit principle of control. So your point is beyond profound, and um, we can't free the mind without understanding its connection to spirit. Mm -hmm. Now in my case, the freedom of the mind came about through involvement in the Black Freedom Movement, joining it in 1960, and then leading the San Francisco Freedom Movement, and I'm having, and, and many of the viewers of the show have heard this, but some have not, having lunch at Virginia's restaurant in the Fillmore, and my vice chair is a brother named Norman Brown. He's a good friend of mine to this day, two years older than me. And he came from Zora Neale Hurston's town. He hadn't seen a white person until he was 18 years of age. I was raised in the Fillmore till seven, but after that, I was in Whiteville. All my teachers were white. The community I was raised in was white. I went to college. They were all white. Law school, they were all white. You know what I mean? But I had a black-minded father that refused to fight in World War II, a proud black mother who surrounded herself with black people. But I was getting a different message from somewhere else. So I'm leading a movement that ends up being the largest of the northern movements, the most complex and most successful. But I'm on the verge of defeat because I'm sitting up here getting ready to chop into some chicken. And Norman Brown, a little guy, he's telling me how the country's run. I'm a government major. I'm supposed to know how the government's run. <laughs> and I realized I didn't know SWAT. He's telling me what people now know. This will be no revelation for most people now. People need revelation on other things about how things are being messed up. Like most people don't know black people or white, know what neoliberalism is. They don't know what that is. So that's another level of knowledge. But in my case, I didn't know that corporations ran the country. I had eaten lock, stock and barrel, the idea that it was a democracy. I was in a movement to open it up so that other black people could have their rights. Now, my father had been giving me a message all along, but it was over my head. He was too conscious for me, except when he whipped white people. <laughs> he worked two jobs, one uh, on the waterfront. That took care of the house, a new car every three years. He didn't need to work a second job, but my sister told me why he worked as a bouncer at the Forbidden City, <laughs> a millionaire's nightclub owned by a Chinese-American, Charlie Love, who I used to caddy for, you know? because he had legal license to let loose his rage on white people without going to jail. And my father used brass knuckles. Oh my God. He would not use a gun because he didn't want to go to jail. I discovered he only had three fears, hospitals, jails, and airplanes. Those are the things he avoided. White people wasn't one of them. And he'd come home at night, give me a war story. He knocked it, because my father looked like he was white, but he had black features. And so they would use the N-word, but in, in working at the Forbidden City, he had to take care of guys who were insulting the Chinese. That meant a fight. He mm -hmm. comes home one night, he had taken on a six foot two Marine Corps captain, pug nose, pug ears, clearly a boxer, a killer, in a fair fight my father couldn't win. He was five foot eight. And so he, he, he was a strategist. This is what I am. I'm a strategist first. And so, he said, officers first. Oh, that was a mistake. The guy's walking downstairs, it goes straight down. It's not at an angle. And my father tipped him, clipped him with those brass knuckles. He rolled all the way down the stairs. Then he put the brass knuckles in his pocket and started selling whoop tickets. If the guy had seen the brass knuckles, he had cleaned my father out. But he figured if he had that much strength, he ran. So I understood that part. It was no issue about fighting white people. But I didn't understand the politics. And so it caused me for the first time in my life, because Norman Brown was hitting me at my level. I'm dealing with corporations. And we're negotiating for jobs for black people. And he's telling me, these are the people that are pulling the strings. And I didn't know it. It caused me to think my first original thoughts in my life politically. I wasn't into loving white people. I didn't have that kind of problem. 
My problem was that I was on remote control. I called myself a remote control automatic pilot, double O so Negro, and didn't know it. You understand? So for the first time, I started thinking for myself, and it was an oh shit moment of, <laughs> to myself, oh shit, and to Norman Brown, I know. And I'm saying to myself, damn. And it's 20 years later that I told Norman he woke me up. It wasn't because I was hiding it, because now I'm on a process of self-discovery. And so it was through that process of freeing my mind that I began to see that that then led me to a Marcus Garvey as the first person that I apprenticed under, and then a Malcolm X. And it led me to study my people while I'm engaged in a struggle. So the freedom of the mind is key. And when you've had that experience, you'll never forget it. I can't tell you, I knew it was 1963. I can't tell you the exact date, but I can tell you exactly what was happening at that time because it was an earth shattering moment. It changed me forever. And some people who saw me later said I was crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because now I had a, because I went through some stages of awakening and, um, now, um, I had anger towards white people. So, of course, they thought I was crazy to be angry with all the shit they put on you. You know what I mean? Angry is the least of the things you should be. Because now I'm seeing things the way my father saw. That's why he was uh, working as a bouncer, so that he could let that rage out. And so my rage was now being directed at corporations and at the police or anybody else, you know, that was, you know, messing with my people. So... That was the beginning of the freedom of the mind, and it set me up for what you were saying later on for my spirit to come out. That would come out later. I thought I had it all together, free of the mind, but this was a precondition for another kind of spiritual freedom that um, occurred later. One of the things that we've discovered in this is that there are stages to awakening. Mm -hmm. So myself and a brother named Boone and Layla Wobobo, I always give, give people credit. If they're involved in something with me and they help, I acknowledge it. I'm not running around here saying, oh, I came up with this on my own. I've innovated five areas of thought and one of action. Yes, yeah, so I've you know, I come up with uh, five innovations, but this one was with someone else. And so this, um, this involvement with Vu and Leila Lubogo, the two of us identify stages that black folks and people of color uh, go through when they're waking up. And these stages are real important in terms of uh, helping people grow and develop because under enslavement, certain <clears throat> psychological transformations took place. And so if we're going to change that, we have to understand that there are stages in freeing the mind. And so uh, what we discovered, me through looking at myself, then looking at Malcolm, and then looking at other blacks who had gone through transformation. Boom and Layla through looking at Franz Fanon. He read more into Fanon than Fanon had. He's always given masters more credit than they deserve. And he himself is a chemist, a martial artist, pianist, and historian. And uh, him and Obinga have a good relationship. He's a good brother. We were rivals. He was more on the Marxist end. But when I hired a lecturer, I hired him. And he said, Why'd you hire me? And I said to myself, I know what would happen if you were in the position. <laughs> I know, but I hired you because you're good. You know what I mean? I hired you because you're good. And so uh, what we discovered is that there are stages of awakening. So people who are going through the freedom mind process, one of the first things they're gonna be identifying is where they're at in these stages. Because it's lifelong work. You're never fully through this process. So there are two parallel stages in uh, the first stage. The one is assimilation. Most of our scholars have made the mistake of putting most black people in this stage. Most black people are not in the stage of assimilation. On the plantation, house slaves, some of them were assimilated. A few field slaves were. More were assimilated than not on, in the house, but some were not. Um, and among middle-class blacks, a larger number face what Du Bois called double consciousness, seeing ourselves through the eyes of others. <clears throat> but the average black person doesn't suffer double consciousness because in the Caribbean, 
Africans dropped that African culture in the Caribbean. And basically the Haitian Revolution went on for that. So some of our scholars have made the mistake of saying that the Haitians had broken consciousness. <laughs> yes, some of their leaders did. A few of their people did, because some were broken. But the majority were not. And in fact, if you looked at Toussaint L'Overture, Toussaint L'Overture, who has been characterized as an assimilated black, was actually not an assimilated black when it came to identity. When it came to identity, he loved himself and his people. He was, in fact, a like a George Washington Carver. He was a master of herbal medicine and communicated with plants and loved life, loved his people, you know. But he did have an assimilation problem with politics. He was assimilated into the French Republican form of government, and that led him to want to be a governor general rather than the president of the country. That was his contradiction. But that was a privileged black. A Desilane didn't have that contradiction at all. He represented the masses. He didn't love white people. Toussaint didn't either. See, Toussaint was a humanitarian. That's what he, Toussaint was. But he tended to favor whites more than he should have. You know, That was part of his republicanism and his Catholicism. But he was also into voodoo at the same time. So um, a minority of our people are in the assimilation stage where they identify with being white, see themselves through the eyes of others. And then at the extreme or at the Clarence Thomas stage where they have absolute contempt for their people. That's a distinct minority of our people. So there is one parallel stage and a Du Bois would represent both double consciousness who then begins to drown himself in African consciousness and then finds himself living in Africa and regretting some of the things he said about Garvey. And Garvey should have regretted some of the things he said about him because it was mutual, <laughs> but not on the ground of self-hatred. Garvey didn't have that issue. Du Bois did. So um, at one stage of the six-fold stages of mental freedom, there's assimilation. A minority of our people are at that. A majority of our people in this country would be at the stage of what we would call black identity, which at one point they called Negro identity, or they called colored identity, and some now call Afro-American identity. But that is a reflection of black people who are expressing <laughs> what I call new African culture, which was formed in this country during enslavement, with African elements and new elements added. The majority of our people are in that position. I did a show on the black church, showing that the black church was not an expression of being brainwashed during slavery. Most enslaved blacks weren't Christians. Blacks took on uh, Christianity on their own terms at the end of slavery and dropped voodoo into what they called the black church. And if you look at the essence of the black church, it's about raising the spirit and the beauty in our culture. Uh, Ella Baker said, the aesthetics in black culture are to be found most highly in the black church. Best speakers are there. Best singers are there. Best leaders, some of them, are there. Uh, but it's the beauty of that. And there's a whole mindset in that. So in the uh, first stage of consciousness, some are in the stage of assimilation. Some are in this stage of black identity. In the Caribbean, that would be a more pure African form of identity, along with hybridity, running alongside of it, British culture or French culture um, and their religion. But at the same time, a pure expression of African culture. Here, we had to fight to recreate what I call a new African culture. Uh, so that's stage one. And so people have to identify what stage are you in. And uh, black identity, I have a saying that people who are the most conscious in black consciousness are close to being as conscious as people who are in the deepest levels of African consciousness. And you gotta appreciate that because that's the majority of our people. And they've done amazing things with that consciousness. The problem is for people who are at the stage of black identity Many of them don't want anything to do with Africa, even though their culture is African-based. And this is the big problem, getting people over that standpoint. So 
These are two stages. Paralleling this, we've discovered that as people are moving through identity, there are two stages that occur alongside this. One is what's called predisturbance, because particularly in the US or Britain or in South Africa, where you're under racism all the time, then there's a question of how racism affects people's consciousness. And so there's a stage that I've discovered, this has been since I've worked with Gul and Layla, because we have another stage that we discovered, but this one I think reflects the masses of our people called predisturbance. And this is a stage where, and this affects a lot of young black people, who face racism, but are not really conscious of how to handle it. And we call this confused disturbance. Malcolm X was at that stage when he was told that he shouldn't be a lawyer. He wasn't even sure if he wanted to be, but that's what he said he wanted to be. And so he got turned off on education at that point because his dream had been smashed because he was the type that depended on other people for what they thought. And that, that, that's his nature. And that's not seeing yourself through the eyes of others. That's just, he was other, other uh, directed. My mother was told the same thing, but because she was self-directed and she was told she should go into home economics as a straight A student, she said, hell no. But when Malcolm got it, because he was very affected by the people around him and particularly non-family members since his family had been broken up, he was particularly affected by others who uh, he looked up to. And he had looked up to this white teacher even though he got in that N word every day. You know, he thought because he was one of the two smartest kids in the class, he had a privilege. So that led him to confuse rebellion. That led him to go against education, to hit the streets, to hustle. He thought he was in rebellion when in fact he was conforming to what white people wanted you to conform to. And so we have a lot of people like that. They may not hit the streets, they may not become drug addicts or drug dealers or pimps or prostitutes, but they will often be confused about what they're facing and how they face it. And so that is a stage, and so people have to be clear if they're at that stage, and a lot of young people are at that stage because racism ain't been explained to them. They're facing it, institutional racism especially. The other stage is the stage of disturbance, and that's a stage where, um, that I experienced when I was undergoing my awakening, where I began to think for myself. I face racism. In this case, I'm being exposed to an explanation for how it works, and it causes me to be disturbed. It causes me to think for myself for the first time. That's real disturbance. That's a precondition for African identity. African identity has stages of development. And if you don't go deeply through those stages, you can get caught in a surface level. So the basic rule in African identity is the depth of African identity is measured by the depth of your plunge into your past. How deeply do you swim in African waters? And then how deeply do you confront yourself because there are stages in this. There's a romantic stage. I won't go through all of them. But there's a stage where Africans can do no wrong. I went through that stage. And white people can't do anything right. And there's some truth to that. You know what I mean? But then when you start running into some Africans who wrong you, you begin to get your head wrapped on right. Or if you go back home and see the realities of Africa, you begin to get down to the real deal. I think that happened with Malcolm when he hit Africa. You know what I mean? He began to rephrase how he defined Pan-Africanism. I did the same thing. And then I realized what I had to do with here. So African identity has stages. And it's stages of work. It's stages of internalization. It's much like a love relationship between two people. You know, In this case, it's your love relationship with your African self. And this is a lifelong process. So there are stages to this. And then the final stage is revolutionary consciousness. Most Africans who go through the stage of African identity never get to this stage. They don't ever get to this stage. And that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. But as Malcolm said, 
The fuse on the stick of dynamite is the smallest part. Light it, everything else explodes. So everybody don't have to be a revolutionary. But guess what? When things heat up, you'd be surprised what you end up doing. So hopefully the ones that are have prepared a way for you because your butt's going to do some stuff that you never thought you would do. So that's kind of like African identity uh, overall. These stages are important. And so it means that what Dr. Julius Garvey said is that we've got to work on ourselves. Self-knowledge is key. So it's knowing yourself. What stage are you at in the identity process? And I'd say this. The black liberation movements that made the biggest mistakes, check out the consciousness of their leadership. And you will find out that they had either started on this path and didn't continue, some of them had never even tried. And some of them, as they got caught into different things, prison, things that happened to them in prison, or various trials in life, relationships that they had, where their weaknesses were preyed upon, then what you see is the potential of that flower blossoming wilted. And with it, movements suffered when they were relying on these leaders. Because, and, and in part, you can't blame them because there was no format laid out. But in part, you can because they were on a path where if they'd stayed on the path, they would have discovered it because they were discovering it. And some of the leaders, some of their most brilliant stuff came from the period in which they were plunging into their past. And the most mad stuff came from when they got off the path. Notice I ain't mentioning names. Figure that out for yourself, because this is not personal. So uh, identity transformation is key. It's key to your mental health. It's key to your psychological health. It's key to you enjoying your life. It's key to being free under a system of oppression. It's key to you not having high blood pressure, a stroke, or anything else, because you have an inner contentment and an inner love with yourself, and that's real key. So, so I wanted to share that, and I wanted to get your response, uh, Brother Garvey. Well, this is really, really absolutely fantastic, you know, because um, um, many of us can, can name something, but, but naming something uh, uh, isn't enough. Um, you, you need to know the different, uh, scientifically, you need to know the different aspects of it. Um, in terms of causes and, and in terms of, of the structure. And, you know, what you've just run down there is, is, is you know, we, we know that we have suffered and we know about the post-traumatic slavery syndrome, but we, we, we don't know how to um, define it appropriately in terms of the damage that it has caused, and we don't know how to treat it because we don't know the different aspects of it. And what you just um, outlined there in terms of the different stages is, is a fantastic um, uh, scientific analysis of what you have to go through in terms of your own self-knowledge and, and, and your mental uh, analysis to get to what, what my dad called his original African mind, which he got to and which we all have to get to and which, you know, um, from my perspective, is unconditioned mind, which is really spirit. So you have to, um, you know, I've had some um, um, sessions with Linda Myers and she has something called optimal psychology and mm -hmm. that's what you're really going through here, um, an optimal psychological approach to mind. Mm -hmm. Because when, when, when you get uh, to really what mind is and, 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 and you can see um, um, that you can transcend mind, then you, you, you get to spirit and, and, and you're free and that, that is freeing your mind and, and it allows you to, to be yourself. And, and it allows you to, to, to be comfortable with being yourself because being yourself gives you a certain uh, certainty in terms of identity because it's that oneness with your creator. So you're absolutely uh, at, at ease. And so you mentioned uh, there's no high blood pressure. There's no, not going to be any anxiety. There's not going to be any fear. Um, so so that, that you can then be continually happy 
if you want to call it that, but more, more likely you should call it joyful. You will be full of joy. Exactly. Um, um, you will be full of peace. Well you will be full of contentment because you will have fulfilled who you are and you can manifest the truth of who you are. And then that accesses your, your, your creative aspect because you're one with the total potentiality of the universe. So this is really, really beautiful. And, um, um, you know, obviously you've, you've put it together in a scientific sense and, and it needs to be projected out there so we all can have access to it. Because like I say, we can name it, but, but we don't know the different stages that one has to go through in order to reverse the, the damage. And, and that's what I, I, I think that we need, is in, when we talk about reparations, we need repair. Repair of the damage that has been done to us, to our psyche, and obviously to our psyche, to our physical body, and also to our spiritual self, which has not been able to express itself. So this is beautiful. I really appreciate what you just said. And I can sense that you have that sense of joy in yourself. I see it in how you present. When you present, you're presenting real deep concepts with ease, and I see the love that you manifest to people, and that tells me there's an inner peace inside of you. I can feel it. And uh, then your high vi higher vibrational frequencies on the spirit plane is a manifestation of that. That's my feeling every day. I wake up, first of all, I picked an environment here <laughs> that would be a little bit of heaven on earth. Beautiful, I yeah. said, uh, we needed that. Uh, I don't need to just wait to go to heaven for this. And I've seen heaven. But, you know, there's an old saying that black people have, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. And I'm like that. You know what I mean? So your point, one of the key points that you make is fear. Um, one of the things that's been done, and it's assumed by many of our Afrocentric psychologists that fear is just a normal thing that our people have, and blah, blah, blah. And we walk around in fear. Fear... Fear is an illusion. You're taught fear. And it becomes real because you believe in it. Uh, babies are not born with fear. You know? and, so, and it's the greatest hindrance to spiritual growth. And it limits you. Because wherever you're afraid, you're not free. And you're locked into that position. And you can go no further. And so... Well, I think you go further in, 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 into hate into anger and into hate. Yes. And that's the cause of wars and violence, etc., yes. etc. Et yes. Yeah. And the internal frustrations, yes. all the internal things. Um, I have a motto that um, I delegate stress, strokes, and high blood pressure to the people that are giving me trouble, and I mean enemies. <laughs> and they can sometimes be black, mm -hmm. but they're usually the system. You know what I mean? That's my thing. And so I've always got a way to project onto whoever's causing the problem, so I don't carry that. Mm -hmm. Another thing is, when you're enjoying happiness, your cellular structure is in good condition. Uh, there's a test that they do, it's called an antioxidant test. Uh, Highland Hospital here, which is the gun repair hospital for poor black people, uh, my cousin ran two wards of it. She has a high school education, just absolutely brilliant. And uh, they do this antioxidant test. Ustadi had me go to his health group, because he overcame serious cancer, cured himself mm -hmm. by going on nutritional therapy and stuff. So they wanted me to go down there for a test, and they hoped that I'd be buying, buying the vitamins. So the, the key thing is, it, they have a test, and it's a little machine that you put your thumb on, and it measures the presence or absence of free radicals. Um, it measures just overall health. Um, and there's a score of, uh, oh, the amount of vegetables that you eat, the amount of fruits that you eat. It shows up in this test. And um, so um, the, the, the scale is uh, 10,000 to 50,000, 10,000. No, it goes to, you was at 90,000. Right? I was 93,000. Yeah, 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 it goes to But 10,000. <laughs> was like an F, yeah. and then up there to a D, add 10, 10. 50 is an A. I was 93,000. Mm -hmm. They've never seen a score like that. Well, I, I didn't know what I was, but I know that I'm never tired. I know that I've never been sick. You know what I mean? I know I'm stronger now 
though slower because I'm older, than I was in my 20s. And I know I've regressed aging, mm -hmm. you know, the aging symptoms and stuff like that. That's come behind uh, good nutritional practices. I went on megavitamins in the 70s um, and uh, good health practices. But the main thing is loving myself. I know that's a key thing. No loving stress. It. Yeah. No stress. That's key. Mm -hmm. I recently had some stress because, uh, and it's rare, and it's because I'm anticipating life work. And I've now come with a breakthrough on world history. It's so big. I'm so excited <laughs> that it stressed me a little bit. I started having some pressure in my, my, my uh, ankles. I've never, I have, rarely had. And so then I looked at my chart and I looked at the, uh, what's called transits, the heavy planets. And it told me, okay, you're at, this is the completion of life work. I got another 20 years. I'm pursuing a strategy to live past 100 healthy. And I'm 83 and have had nothing wrong with me. Nothing. And the rule is, when you hit this age, even if you start to get something wrong with you in the 90s, you'll skip through the 100s. And this is the key to living without disease for most, most of the time. So then what I did is I started to revamp my schedule so that because I realized that it was the anticipation of the work that I'm doing, not that it's stressful, it's exciting. And it was getting me to step over. I have a rule. I don't write after 12. One, my creative juices stop flowing. But two, that's when stress can come in. And then at night, I do mindless stuff like watching TV or something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Take my mind and go on vacations and stuff. I've been doing that since the 70s. But I stopped, I started doing more work because I got a major breakthrough on world history. It is monumental. And I've been doing research that's just been so exciting, but it's at the time I know I'm not supposed to do it. So I've had to scale back on that. But other than that, some people are only free in Africa. I'm free wherever I am. A cop stops me. If I got the edge on them, and I've had the edge on some cops, I take it. <laughs> and if I don't, I'm just myself, but I don't ever time. And I tell my wife, don't do no timing in my presence. I'm here, I'm looking out for you. I don't want to hear any of this, you know, uh, be extra nice in the yes, sir, no. So I don't do none of that. So I'm the same way with whites as I am with blacks. But that's a freedom of the mind. So I'm no more free, a sense of freedom here than I am in Africa. Now I know this is, or Cuba. I was in Cuba, that was a real sense of freedom because it's a different type of society there. But I know the illusion in Africa. You got all these black people running everything, but I know who's running the black people <laughs> who look like they're running everything. You understand? But even if they were, when you're mentally free, the rest of you is free. And when you ain't got no fear, you make the right decisions all the time. So I'm just simply saying that, and I'm not bragging. This is a natural state you should be in. Quit accepting fear as your companion. Fear is a damn illusion that you've allowed to occupy your mind. Fearlessness is a natural state. Now, there's a danger in fearlessness in that you may underestimate danger. And so in any movement I've led, I've known that, so I've been careful. I said before I've led any movement, no one's going to get hurt by my ego. So I haven't taken steps to put people in danger, though I have taken a few that were dangerous. A couple where I could have died and my group could have died, but it was for the group. And I weighed the percentages, 75%, that it would go the other way. But I, I've only done it a couple of times. I don't do that, you know what I mean? So that's the real key to identity transformation. Free the mind, you free the behind. You enjoy your loving life. You hear me? And you're not running around. And I don't use the term white supremacy. There was a time when it was valid. The British ruled the ways for 300 years. The Americans for 27. They've gone down from 45 to 72. Mm -hmm. They're now in the two. They're going down. I don't use the term white supremacy anymore because they're not supreme anymore. That's why. You know what I mean? They are declining white supremacy, but I don't use the term at all. They created that term. And when you use a term like that, they like that term because they're supreme. 
That's their ethos, Lord and Master. That's what it means to be an Aryan. So I don't use the term. You want them? Go right ahead. But it ties you up in knots. You hear me? Ties you. You don't hear white people running around here talking about no black supremacy. They ain't waking up every day worried some black person's going to blow them away. You know? So why should you? Yes, they could try. Yes, I heard Dr. Garvey say, you could, yesterday you could be walking down the street and somebody take a pot shot at you. But what they can do to you, you can do to them. You just have to be strategic about it. Be smart about it. You know what I mean? So that's free the mind on the surface level. And what we wanted to do is Brother Ustadi, who has been uh, in the Pan-African People's Organization for over 50 years, was a student of mine uh, in the 70s. I was only I'm probably five or six years older than him. Um, and he had been in the military. He had a whole life. This brother here is a mathematician. Um, he teaches in our school. Uh, he's a master organizer. He's a master mechanic. If you tell him the symptoms on a car, he can tell you what's wrong with it. And he's a master printer. And a master organizer and a hell of a psychologist. So he's one of uh, my smartest people. When the FBI denied, tried to deny me tenure, and I beat it with the help of Asa Hilliard, I thought about it, because friends of mine said, ah, oh, that job don't mean nothing. Mm -hmm. And I always, I, t I, I remember I took bad advice one time, and I had to live with it, and I learned a lesson from that. Uh, listen to what everybody says, but always ask yourself, is that in your best interest? So then I started turning it over, and I said, okay, because the FBI was running a COINTEL pro, counterintelligence program on me, of all the people going up for tenure in Asian American and Black Studies, I was the only one being written up. Mm -hmm. And that was because the provost had a PhD. His name was Gar uh, Garrity. He had tried <laughs> to break the student strike. He had a PhD in criminology. He worked with the FBI. Mm -hmm. And he tried to deny anyone who was an activist, white, black, brown, red, or yellow tenure. And so he was after me. And so Asa Hurried was in charge of my tenure committee and helped fight for me as a dean of education at San Francisco State. So when I ran through this, I sat down and thought about it. Because I was only making $800 a month, the lowest level of a lecture. You know? But then an apartment only costs $200 a month. Yeah, right. you know? <laughs> so I said, OK, what am I going to get out of this? I'm going to get paid to radicalize black students. I'm going to get about five months off a year while I'm doing that. And uh, I'll teach three days a week or two days a week. And my practice was I would go in and teach from 8 to 12, bring my lunch, peanut butter lunch, and then go in the community and organize. And I did that for 40 years. Most of my time was organized. I didn't even have office hours. You had to call me at home. You know what I mean? So I said, okay, I get paid for radicalizing my students. And at that time, it was black students. That's all I wanted. That's all that took my classes. Later, they got the message that I was accessible because then I realized I'm in a position to radicalize white, brown, red, and yellow. Mm. But when I was super black, it was only for black people. <laughs> you know what I mean? So then I went and got the job, and then I had the opportunity to run into people like Ustadi Dabidi. is a brother named Shapaza. There's a whole bunch of them, but they've been in this movement for over 50 years, totally dedicated, and they went through this six-fold stages to mental freedom. When we do the uh, training on uh, YouTube, Ustadi, Fanny McKinney, uh, Davidi Tambuzi, and myself, we'll be doing that training, 10 people each, 40, you know, for a year. So I asked Ustadi to come in and talk about um, the six-fold stages to mental freedom how it affected him, uh, how he sees it uh, being used, uh, how he's used it in the community himself, and the value of it for black people in the awakening process of study. Thank you. Uh, I guess the biggest thing uh, in reference to me. Talk louder. I had an early, <laughs> I had an early start with, um, I would say. Um, being born in Texas, you can't have an early start with the other people. So it's, it, I don't know if I ever will sleep 
I'm not quite, let me clarify that statement. Uh, my father went to the seventh grade, my mother went to the eighth grade, because that's, that's the highest grade the school where I come from was, was the eighth grade. Uh, and I think since the time I was born until I was 10 years old in the fourth grade, that I was brought up in a cotton field. So it kind of changed the relationship black to white, especially if the white folks are in charge of the house you're living in, not even a house or room. So that, I don't know, I guess daddy will never had too much. I had too many aunties and uncles that just did an X. They couldn't read or write, but they was exceptionally sharp. So I guess my begin is really my ending in unconsciousness. Um, uh, well, I take, that, I take that back since I'm looking at it. My wife had been trying to tell me I should go to school because I had a GI Bill and they would pay. Matter of fact, like you say, rent was only two hundred dollars. I get four seventy five just going to school, you know. So uh, I guess that was it. wasn't really a awakening. It was a awakening. It was like because my wife had been preaching to me for at least two or three years. Go to school, go to you know. And what happened was, uh, I worked in a job corps as a, as a counselor. And uh, Mr. Diggs was the uh, director. Mr. Diggs uh, told me a year ahead of time, man, look, I'm going back to LA. I'm getting older. You should be able to take over. I said, yeah, I could take over because I can run the whole place. It was a residential center. And the problem was that I didn't have that little piece of paper. I didn't have a, a degree. I didn't have a degree. So I didn't know that until I tried to apply for the job and they say you have to have a degree. I didn't have a degree. And so I always had a good writing hand. The only reason I had a good writing hand because my Uncle Bill, who never, he just did an X, he would always say, boy, boy, I was in the seventh grade. Oh, write my name. Write my, ooh, that's pretty. That's pretty. So that made me write good simply because I was trying to help him out. And so what happened was that I could write good, I could spell. So that's, that's all, because we had to document everything we did in the law. And it happens that the, the assistant director was Tucker. And his brother got hired as the assistant director. I couldn't even take the assistant. And in, in there it said no nepotism. And you can't get, get, but they did that. But it's a government job. I'm cool with that. But the problem came is when he tried to write a sentence he couldn't put together. And then he, you couldn't read his writing. That was, that was a wake-up call for me. I said, now, they done violated all these rules. And, and because I don't have a degree, I can run this whole place. You know what I'm saying? I can do it. I can get in the kids like me. So um, it, was, it was, I asked him, uh, what did you get your degree in, sir? He told me he got his degree in leisure recreation. I never heard of that. I said, what is that? <laughs> oh, you know, like uh, at hotels, they have Batman, they have, you know, he was telling me all this. Stuff. So that, I guess that was my serious, that I need a piece of paper. I really didn't need a piece of paper. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think it's very good to have a piece of paper. It's very good to have a piece of paper, uh, a degree. So don't, don't get me wrong on that. Let me clarify that statement. You should have a degree. Uh, but long story short, he's the one that really made me quit my job and go to uh, not listen to my wife and, 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 and go to San Francisco State where I met Brother Shaka. I, was in, I came out there in 73. And then I told Thabiti on Tambuzi, who, who's in Zanzibar right now, that I think my cousin had got killed and so I had to go back home to bury him. I told Thabiti to go to the meeting because we was having a meeting. Papa was having a meeting. He was doing flyers. And so that's how I got into the organization. That he got into the organization. I think I'm a lethal guy in the reason. Because just like Jabari, it was, it was a bunch of us, you know, we, we had got into, um, it was the black, it was, what was it? It was the black student union when we got into it, right? We didn't, black student union had zero dollars. We changed to the pan African. I want to change to the pan African people's organization, but they said, no, you got to make it a student's organization. So we changed it to, you know, and so through our consciousness, I think it was 70, 
76, 76, we ran all black slate. We had 22,000 people on campus, there's 1,500 of us. Only 1,500 black people. And all of them are black, I'm just saying. But anyway, you set up a thing, we ran, we ran a slate, we only got one brother in for treasure, his name was, uh, uh, he had a Shubin, he had a Jewish name, his name was Shubin, Ralph Shubin. And the first time they ran, I gave them advice, because I was the advisor, but I'd never go to any meetings, you know, but I gave them advice. The black students are a distinct minority at San Francisco State. You need to form some alliances. Oh, no, the first time. That's because the reason, now, I, I respect what shot but what we was trying to do, we was trying to acknowledge that there's black people on this campus. And we had a little security wing for the sisters that, you know, because the brothers were giving the sisters little problems in the dorms, you know, we had that going on. We had a lot of things going on. And so, so the next time around, all the brothers shot to leave. We, we had, we had, we, okay, we had Naraza, we had Pace, that was Filipino. We had the, the Native Americans. We had the SDS, the left white boys, and we won. Dabiti, the one you talk about, he was president. I think uh, Daima was vice president, all pop on <laughs> uh, uh Michael Greenwood, he was treasurer. So we, we, not only did we have the, the, the three executives, but we had the BOD, the board of directors. That means the speaker of the ledge and one more I can't call. And we had half of the, uh, Half of the half of the ledge, so we did a good thing. You see, that was, and I guess that I guess he, he I have to acknowledge Brother Shaka. Brother Shaka gave my name. Brother Shaka did all this. So he, he, we that's where we first got a concept. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing was the values that we learned. That, and 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 a lot of us we instilled the values in ourselves, and so we just. What know, are some of those values? In, in reference to uh, the values you learn. Explain what some of those values. Oh, 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 oh well, the, the, the most, the, I guess the most, I don't know, let, me, let me see which one is important and what me and Thabiti always. <laughs> I mean, Thabiti is like the twin to me. Um, he would go, I would be on one side of you, and Thabiti would be on the other side. We'd just go up and down like this to you, you know, till you want to fight us, you know. But that was, <laughs> that was just our consciousness. So, um, we are the, one of the most in, important thing I think that that really got us over. We always respected the women because that, I wasn't married. I was married, but that baby wasn't. You know, that, now at the school, I'm just talking about the school now, right? That was that was one of the things. So the principal thing, the most principal thing is is that is that, is that we we as a people we have we have to have value. We have to have some type of thing that's gonna get us over. So we, we always try to control whatever we did. You know, we, we think it through. But whatever we say, that's what we was going to do. We had people that would I literally leave our group because we wouldn't switch. We, we was like focus. The focus was especially um, for our people. Um, the, matter of fact, that first slate that we ran, all back, we had people leave because they thought we was racist. Mm -hmm. And we told them we could not be racist. But it was a it was a whole thought process. So I I would say uh, the most important thing is love your people. That was one thing, and you, and you never compromise on your issues. You know, you, you well let me clarify that. You can you can you can we have a strategy, and then if we're gonna we can we can kind of switch our strategy, but we always stay with our principal points that we want to hold. And I guess that was that was that was to me. I'm just. I'm looking back now. That's what I'm trying to go backwards on this. Okay, I think that was that was that was that was one of the. I guess that's what kept me that a lot of us because we all there's about five of us, or six of us that got our names together. So we went to orientation with Brother Shock. It was like six months, right, Brother Shock? You know, and so six or eight months. Yeah, something like that. <clears throat> but but we, we was just locked in, and so we actually to the people we still we still locked in. You see, that's the good part. Uh, like Shaka, uh, diabetes. I can't even get mad at you guys. I can't even call you guys no name. You know, because we, we, that's who we are. That's who we are. So it's that holding that point of who you are and respecting each other. That, that's, you know, I can go through the other one. Diabetes, diabetes made an observation. That's his friend. He's a Leo. His friend is an Aquarius, so they're opposites. Yeah, right. 
<laughs> so they each see the other side. Each one's strong where the other one's weak. Mm -hmm. True, um, true. So Davidi made this comment that the key to his transformation was what he called immersion. And by immersion, he meant his total life was involved in this. And he lived in our headquarters, which we own, mm -hmm. Malcolm X Unity House, Marcus Garvey Hall. Mm -hmm. So he lived there. So it was a 24-7 thing for him. And that's what enabled him, he said, to work his transformation to the point that he spends more time in Africa almost than he does here, mm -hmm. has set up an African guest house in Zanzibar, mm -hmm. and has played a key role in keeping our school going along with him. But that immersion, practicing what you preach 24-7, yeah. was key to the whole thing. It has, it has to be because it, it, it's, it's not easy out here. I, I tell anybody, it is not easy out here. Right now, I'm holding down three brothers at my job, and it's very difficult to, to, to hold that down. Why is it difficult? Because you just got to bob and weave. I mean, I'm not mad at nobody, but I just feel like uh, if it's all about the mind, going back to free your mind, not, not, not trying to knock off. But the thing is, all of us are made up of matter. It can be gas, liquid, solid, or, you know, something to that effect. But the key point is just that, do you really believe in your people? <laughs> That's the problem that we have. You don't believe in your people. So I cannot tell somebody else to not to do something if I don't believe in my people. It's impossible. You, you just can't do it, you know. So my, my, my thing is I was sharing with you about how when I did the, the whole driveway, the asphalt, the paint booth, ain't nothing but brothers on big equipment. Hey, man, across the street is an Asian. Ain't nothing but Asian there. Across the cat, across the white. Mixed. So I know they were looking at me like I'm crazy, but why not? I mean, you know, I, and, and it wasn't easy. It took me almost two years to get the brother there, but when he got there, he got busy. So that's, that's, it's, 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 um, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for black folks to believe in black folks. And it's very, even more difficult for them to spend their money with black folks. That's, that's the hard part. So you can talk all you want to. I take my daughter for instance. See, the worst thing that you can do now is have DoorDash or you ain't got to go get no food. You, uh, you want a book? Call Amazon. They, they, you know, they just so that leaves the black man out. <laughs> you understand know what I'm saying? So, oh, in respects to that, that that that's what I'm saying re in regards to. So the the kids that we got today, that's they got blinders on because this all has been they've been programmed. So the game is a reprogram. That's the most important thing that I see right now. And if you got some good ones. They can go like this and still go like this. So you have to you have to be um, like a chameleon. <laughs> you have to be with them, but not not of them. And that's the key. That's the only way you're going to pull people. That that yeah. That's why I love uh, Jabari because <laughs> because he he can be that chameleon. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So so that that's, that's the one that's in the Garvey. Yeah, yeah, the brother that were there, mm -hmm. the kids that I work, I call them that kids. That was a big deal last night, all those young people. I, mm -hmm. He brought, I'm telling you, I, I, mean, I ain't trying to knock him, but I, I love the little brother, because I don't work with him too many times, you know what I'm saying? And that's the key to me. You have to have a core, and we can get the part of them in the core. They they still got to be, what you kind of say, you know, tighten up. That's all. You know, just whiz. That's all. That's all. That's all. That's whiz. And so that, I think that's the most important thing in regards to anything that we do, you know. So what yeah. I can say about him, Stoudy, is he's consistent and he's very kind. Uh, we've had elders who are dying. Who's going to take them to the hospital? Who's Stoudy? Who's at their house bringing them food? Who's Stoudy? You know what I mean? Um, so he's got this kind heart at the same time. So it's real love. I don't know if it's kindness. It's, it's, it's just love for your people. So instead of talking about it, you do be about it. Right. You see, that's that's where I come from. I don't talk about it, I be about it. And so I think that's the most important thing uh, in, in respect to that. It's, it's good to talk, don't get me wrong. But I want to see your action. And your action, and that's why I'm really high on Jabari. 
because they already show me. I don't work with them. That's 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 what I'm looking for. I ain't looking for that other. I, I got theory running out of my nose. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I mean, really. And, and I think that's the key, Brother Shock. And I was just telling you about some young people we got, you know, that, that I can collaborate with. And that's the key. And, and they, you know, to me, if we're going forward, we must go forward together. And one of the most important things that you can do is show respect and do things to elders. And if you can do that, you, I'm on your side. You know, I'm, I'm really on your side. Shaka, you got anything to add in your own identity transformation process? Yeah, I, I can tell a real quick story on the book. Be, be, before my transition. I remember when I was young, I remember I'm growing up in Philly. It was summertime, it was hot. And I remember friends of mine coming over, knocking on the door, I go to the door, and they say, come on out, man, we're going to do this, whatever, whatever. And I remember saying it to them. I remember like it was yesterday. I said, I'm not coming out in that sun get all black. <laughs> <laughs> and so years later, when I guess I was around I'm 61 now, I guess I was around 28, 29. <laughs> and I get, a brother term, you know, a brother was talking all kind of conscious stuff and it hooked me. And I asked him about, you know, what 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 10 books would you start with? Mm -hmm. And he gave me the list of books. One was Franz Fanon, you know what I mean? Right. You know, um, uh, it, it, it was a few, one was uh, Jay Rogers, you know, Superman the Man, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? These type of things, whatever. Good book. You know what the I mean? Yeah, book. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, 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 and so I read those books, and well, one thing is I found out he hadn't actually read the books because when we started talking about <laughs> it, he, really, he, you know what I mean? he might have. Heard some conversations about the book. He didn't really read it. But anyway, I, I digress. But what happened was I got so angry as I started, because that just lit the fuse. You know what I mean? Then I really got into, and like Dr. Garvey, reading like 10 books at a time and all this kind of stuff like that. It was crazy with it. People say, you got to carry out one book's graph. What? Anyway, uh, I remember the anger that I felt. That was the first stage. I got so pissed off because I remember all these things. Like that day when my friend came over telling me to come outside. I'm like, man, what can make somebody hate themselves mm. that much? And, and, and it really, you know, and it took me a minute to come full circle to where I, I, uh, I, 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 I accepted and embraced my understanding of uh, what you call Aryan dominance, you know what I mean? Ary Aryan domination, uh, which which white supremacy they use as a system of maintaining it. I get that, but I understand that there was another level. Another level was this embracing embracing the uh, uh, the realities, the inherent realities that comes along with uh, understanding that. You know what I mean? Um, what, what it means in terms of that. And then it was, the, the, the next level was um, embracing the responsibilities that goes along with now what you know to be true. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so I had to get there. And so I went through that type of thing and it took years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what you just said, acknowledging where you're at. You know what I mean? Being honest about that. And that's an indication that you're dealing with yourself. And when you don't, it's an indication that this is just some talk. So the color thing, that's one of the big legacies of slavery. My family didn't have that issue. And my father was very light. He caught hell because he was light from blacks and because he was black, I don't care what his shade was, from whites. And uh, so he was the defender of his family, but proud of his color. Me with color, I didn't get it because my family wasn't into that, but I measured my color based on him. And my father was lighter than me. Mm -hmm. And so I, my wife made this comment coming from her son, who's brilliant. He's a, he comes from a family of really brilliant people. His father 
was the first to go to Oxford and get a degree in architecture in Barbados. Mm -hmm. And he could have gone to Oxford. He said, Mama, I don't want to be white. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he said of me, he said, Shaka doesn't really realize he's like. <laughs> well, I was raised in a house where that wasn't the issue. My father was very proud of his blackness. As light as he was, we were confused on it at first because I remember in first grade, I don't remember what my mother told me. We came home one day and talking about my father was white because this is our first time to be in the educational yeah. 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 atmosphere of white people. And my, my mother went on us, you know what I mean? Uh-huh, <laughs> blah, blah, you know what I mean? But he was a light-skinned, proud black man. Yeah. And there was no color issues with them. Their friends were black, light, dark, and when they divorced, his girlfriends were of all colors. They were just all fine. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he never understood why they liked him. Because he was a man's man and a lady's man. He didn't play around. If he had one woman, he was with them. Mm -hmm. But when you were around, my father's called W.H., William Henry. That was my name. Mm -hmm. uh, William Henry Bradley. When you were around him, the lady said they all felt safe. <laughs> You're darn right. Because my father would warn a guy. My godmother was out at a dance during World War II. She was my mother's best friend and um, divorced, and so she's dancing. A guy put his hand on her butt. My father went up and he always gave you a warning. Don't do it again, buddy. He did it again. My godmother said he got common, which is an indication of older black people's identity. They considered themselves royalty. Mm, mm. And that's something that's often missed in the mm -hmm. carriage of older mm -hmm. black people, mm -hmm. the way they dress. Our mm -hmm. psychologists read it as they're imitating white people. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're wearing the same clothes. Mm -hmm. No, it's their pride. Wow. It's their regality. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Common. I'm not a common person. You don't treat me like that. The next time my father knocked the guy out. Mm -hmm. And then my godmother told me the story. She was sick and my mother told me to go see her. I went and saw her. She said, that W.H. He was some man. So uh, around my father, there was never any question around color, nor my mother, and there was no question of manhood. But I'm not a family person, meaning I'm not geared towards thinking in terms of family. My brother was. I'm a world person. So I never <laughs> thought, oh, my father did this, so I'm going to do that. But it was an example. You know what I mean? It was an example. But mine was mental slavery. Mine was thinking somebody else's thoughts and not knowing it. That was my problem. That was not my, my father didn't go to a, a grade of school. Mm. He taught himself how to read by reading newspapers. I just found this out from my sister because they would always say he had an eighth grade education. He had none, <laughs> but he was self-educated. <laughs> he knew that Hitler would lose World War II when he went into Russia. You know what I mean? He said he's fighting too many fronts. The war's over. Mm. And when the Japanese dropped bombs down smokestacks of American ships, my father was laughing. He said, uh, yeah, not supposed to have peripheral vision, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and when he went before the draft board, Malcolm X did this, and my father had the same solar lunar relationship as your father, the last phase of the moon, just before the new moon. Malcolm had that same last phase before the moon, new moon. The sister, Fania, uh, who will be here a little later, she has that same solar lunar relationship. That means you've gone through all the cycles of the moon. This is the last phase. Lenin had that. That can be a revolutionary. If you pipe into the moods of the masses, you can be prophetic. Garvey was, my father was. He goes before the draft board, the same thing that Malcolm did, but Malcolm had to juice himself up. My father was just himself. And he never told my mother this. He went before the draft board and he said, draft me, I ain't killing no Germans. The whites that are lynching my people, they ain't got no German accent. Draft that, me, I'm not killing no Japanese, they look just like me. Draft me and give me a gun and I'll shoot every redneck. And my mother had banned him from cursing. So we never heard him curse. By the way, my wife thinks I don't curse. I picked that up from my father. It's mm -hmm. unconscious. Mm -hmm. and never curse around her. I'm a warrior. Mm -hmm. Damn right I curse. Yeah, you know what I mean? yeah. But not in her presence. And I know he went off. And they called him red because of his complexion. But I know that he had a temper. We never saw that temper. Mm -hmm. 
My mother whipped us. My father never touched us. It was always with his mouth, with his mind. You know what I mean? You draft me, I'll kill every redneck cracker in sight. And he got a 4F. And after he died, I told my mother this. And he never told my mother that. Why didn't he tell me? I said, because he was secure in his manhood. And we kept the father. You know what I mean? Yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. Three kids, my mother's going to have to raise them and work. Mm -hmm. And he come back scatterbrained after mm -hmm. being in a war that, you know, he had no business in. Mm -hmm. So I, I was surrounded with that. My father, one bad black man. Mm -hmm. You hear me? And, 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 and in the movement, he was telling people, put security on him. I got no fear. I wasn't thinking of security. He was telling them various moves to make and shit. They told me this later. You know, <laughs> that was my father, and my father was a security conscious person by nature. That was him, a one man army. He had no movement to be in. You know what I mean? So that was my privilege. My mother and my father. My mother had pride. My father had black pride. Mm -hmm. She was a Leo woman. She carried herself with dignity, and they called her queen. She was as pretty. My wife says prettier than Lena Horne. Mm -hmm. She had those looks, mm -hmm. but she never had no attitude about it. Mm -hmm. But she, she'd take hours to get herself ready. And <laughs> the only person my father crawled to was my mother. When he had done something slightly wrong, he got on his knees and begged. I told my wife, that ain't never happened. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get on my knees and propose. I ain't doing that. But I respected my father for doing mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. This guy would take the heads of 10 white people if he had to, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I'm on his knees for my mother. I said, Dad, you ever play around? I didn't have time. No, he loved her too much. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So being honest about this transformation is really key. Yeah. Let me take